This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, James Just. I got our co-host, Richard Fields. And with us today is a special guest, Judge Michael Warren out of Oakland County, Michigan, Superior Court. Circuit Court. Circuit Court. Oh, man, I knew I was going to butcher that one at the end of the day. Thank you for joining us. You also have a podcast and a book. We'll get that out of your way here first. Your podcast is, please. It's called uh, Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics. And it can be found on Apple and Google Play and a ton of other platforms. Again, it's Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics. And it's about what it sounds like. It's about uh, the Constitution. Uh, the Declaration of Independence, American History, Founding Fathers, and other great patriots. Um, and it has some special episodes uh, dealing with uh, current events. But right now I'm going through the Declaration of Independence, basically line by line, sometimes word by word. Uh, so it's about one year. A in revolutionary the document. I, I worked uh, at the Pacific Legal Foundation for about 10 years. And every year, uh, on I, I forget what day it was, some, someday, we, we would, uh, Patriot Day or something, I forget what the specific occasion was, we would read the Declaration of Independence line by line oh, yeah. uh, in its entirety. And it is extremely uh, revolutionary if you get right down to it. Tell us a little bit about that. No question. So um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That when any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to establish new government, laying its foundation such principles and organized power such form as to them so seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Now, those words from the Declaration of Independence were revolutionary in 1776, and they remain revolutionary today. Just alter like, or change? Are we at a point in, in American history where it's time to alter or change? Well, uh, that's a great question. So um, I think that we are always at a point in history where you, you should consider altering or changing the form of government. You know, we're, we're very fortunate. The uh, We have a constitution that can be amended. We have legislatures, uh, both state and uh, federal, that can be swept out of office as well as governors and presidents. So, you know, technically we have, we alter and abolish at least the people that govern uh, with every election, at least have the ability to do it. Um, I, actually, I think there's a there's a series of fascinating proposed um, constitutional amendments that could, that could be enacted. Uh, so, um, you know, we're a revolutionary people. Uh, and this really freaks out the high school teachers and others when you start talking this way, at least some. Uh, but that, you know, we, we were born through a revolution and we should never forget that. And when we see um, oppression, injustice, uh, tyrannical moves, uh, we, we certainly have uh, the God given right and the duty to oppose that. And um, if there's a long train of abuse and usurpations, you know, the colonies took, uh, it was started about, took about 15 years to uh, throw off the shackles of British tyranny. So you don't want to do it just because you know somebody, there's a law or regulation that comes in, you don't take that lightly. Um, light and transient causes is the way that the uh, founders termed it. But if, if there's a long train of abuse and usurpations, which are evidencing a uh, attempt to uh, suppress your rights, then uh, everything's on the table. You uh, uh, have a, uh, I guess you would call it an originalist uh, uh, declaration of independence and constitutional uh, perspective on the law. Is that would that be uh, accurate? Yeah. So I'm a I'm a lowly county judge, and I have right, the I jurisprudence of the U.S. Supreme Court and the Michigan Supreme Court. But my personal view, uh, which is uh, adhered to by many members of the Michigan and uh, U.S. Supreme Court, is that we sh the role of the judge and the court is not to make the law. We wanted to make the law. You should run for the legislature, if or uh, pass a ballot initiative, or um, run for governor or or president. But if you want, the, my role is to take the law as it's been passed and enacted, and to apply it as it was interpreted and meant to be at the time that it was passed. So there's kind of a debate in uh, the legal circles about a living constitution. 
and um, an originalist perspective or a common understanding perspective. I'm definitely in the camp of the common understanding that we, the constitution is not perfect, never has been, never will be, but the way to fix it is through amendments and through uh, legislation and not, not by judicial fiat. What do you make of the uh, New York Times 1619 project, which uh, tends to uh, denigrate our founding fathers as opposed to venerate them? Yeah, so the 1619 project, just in case some of your viewers are unaware of it, is a project that was started by the New York Times about a year ago in the summer. And um, it it is a subversion of and a twisting of American history. It's called 1619 because they say that the country was not founded in 1776, but it was founded in 1619 because that was the year that the first slave ships came to Jamestown. Or I should say ships bearing slaves came to Georgetown, uh, excuse me, Jamestown um, and in, in Virginia. And so they say our, our, the, the revolution was fought to preserve um, slavery, which is uh, a, a great a perversion and twisting of the truth. Uh, and that everything uh, in American history has only been defined by race and uh, oppression. And that all the good in America has only happened because or racial minorities um, have uh, have forced the change. And it's just, it's now there is truth. I mean, there is no question. You know, I, I said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And we we held, we, we were hypocrites. We, we did not embrace that. Um, you know, from a libertarian perspective, we had slaves. Uh, we had uh, a, a, men could not vote if they didn't own um, property. For the most part, there was exceptions. Almost no women could vote. So, you know, what you considered uh, part of the the uh, social compact, those that could participate, was a very small percentage of people. But uh, in that time period, and in the context of all of human history. We were the freest nation there ever existed. And at that time. At that time. And those yeah. founding first principles um, about equality, about unalienable rights, limited government, the social compact, um, equality, and the right to alter, abolish, and oppressive government, those hearkened people to and motivated and inspired people to change what happened in America so that we called out that hypocrisy. And instead of throwing our founding documents um, in, in the trash can and burning them, we said we needed to live up to them. And that's what motivated the emancipation movement, the suffragette movement, the civil rights struggles, the radical Republicans in Congress uh, in, in the wake of the Civil War. And and uh, the 1619 Project's trying to do, you know, trying to pervert the history as if all other societies were great except for America. Uh, which is, which is, um, you know, very, um, it, it's subversive and they're doing it. The, the person that started it up and is in charge of it has admitted that the whole point of it is a political purpose, which is not to teach good history, but to obtain reparations for African-Americans. Now, maybe there's a great argument for reparations for African-Americans, um, but it shouldn't be through perverting history and civics, which is what they're trying to do. So, well before that existed, um, my daughter and I started a project called Patriot Week. And uh, so you might call that the 1776 antidote to 1619. And what we do is uh, it's beginning on September 11th, the anniversary of the terrorist attacks and ending on September 17th, the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. We celebrate a founding first principle from our Declaration of Independence. Those I just went through the rule of law and animal rights, limited government, the social compact equality, the right to alter, abolish and oppressive government. Key documents and speeches that embody that. Founding fathers and other great patriots that made they come alive in American flags from history. And it was just recognized unanimously by the U.S. Senate uh, last year and by 17 other states. So we've made a lot of progress. The uh, podcast I mentioned, uh, Patriot Lessons, American History and Civics, is now growth of that. We have a TV show called Patriot Lessons. And you go to patriotweek.org and, and learn all about it. Um, and what we're trying to do there is teach honest history, recognizing our flaws, recognizing that we're not perfect today. We have a long way to go, especially from a libertarian perspective, um, but that um, we should be building on what makes America great and not trying to tear it down. Yeah, well, history is a complex thing with much of context. And that's my problem with the 1619 Project is it essentially takes, it has some truths and it takes it completely out of context. You ignore 
the rest of history and say, well, from this perspective, this is what history looks like. And while that's true, that's what history looks like from that perspective. But there's lots of other perspectives that has to be added to that in order to paint the actual picture. Um, like in history, many of the founding fathers understood that uh, contradiction in those the documents is that there was going to come a time that they were going to have to pay. They're going to have to answer for that contradiction. Is, is that kind of a true statement? Oh, absolutely. You know, the founding fathers were, especially in 1776, which is different than a couple decades later. Uh, or a few decades later, but in 1776, you know, Ben Franklin started an abolitionist society in Philadelphia, first one in human history. Okay, so you got to give Ben his due. He owned slaves as a younger person, figured out it was wrong. Uh, Benjamin Rush, another uh, tremendously important kind of forgotten founding father, also felt that way. Uh, there, Thomas Paine, um, you know, the rights of man and uh, common sense and the crisis also felt that way. Um, and there were others that owned slaves, but recognized it was immoral. Thomas Jefferson said, you know, I, I quake from the future of my country if we don't take care of this problem. Um, later on in the, so nobody, everybody kind of recognized it was, it was there and it was wrong, but it was a fact of life. Like it had been in ancient Rome, it had been in, in um, throughout human history. Later on, some in the South started to say it was a positive good. And that truly is a perversion of we hold these truths to be self-evident, though all men are created equal. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that kind of undergirded uh, Southern resistance to humming in slavery and controlling it. But and out of the founding, not, you know, there, were, there weren't a lot of people running around and saying, this is a really good thing. Um, it was either a fact of life, they didn't get much thought to it, or they were opposite, you know, vociferously opposed to it. Um, and, but it was, as you said, James, it's, it's very complicated. And um, the, the problem with the 1619 project is it just uses a broad stroke and paints everybody the same way. It's funny, um, uh, you know, I, I, I get my news from a lot of different sources. So I listen to Tom Wood show and uh, a lot of libertarian perspectives and Heritage Foundation, kind of traditional conservative. And then I listen on occasion to the World Socialist website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I visit. The, Tr the Trotsky folks, right? And what's great about them is they call out the 1619 Project and they say the New York Times is a show for the Democrat Party. And um, it's not about race, it's about economics. And so, um, and they, you know, their perspective is that the American Revolution was glorious um, and um, it, you know, we need to keep going further. And what's the, the problem with American society today isn't race, it's class. Uh, so they're all painting with these big, broad strokes, and I, I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. Yeah, but when you well, it history, seems to me that the the problem with American society today, well, we have you know witnessed the the riots that have been going on all summer since the uh, uh, the pandemic shut down. We we have uh, and the and the police killings in Minneapolis and elsewhere. We have a a, a, a system where racism is a very uh, real present day evil. It has not gone away. We have a uh, we have a society where uh, not only racism, but also uh, the institution of government making life more difficult for anybody who is poor, uh, black, white, or any color, uh, is, is a very real problem. I'm talking about licensing laws. I'm talking about uh, uh, asset for civil asset forfeiture. I'm talking about a whole lot of different uh, policies that are ingrained and part of the system. I'm talking about monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy, a lot of things that have the effect of widening the gap between rich and poor in very, very uh, real ways. Um, how does uh, Liberty Week, how does your work tie into the, the problems that we're really seeing uh, uh, bloom today? Yeah, so Patriot Week, we, we don't really take stands on, you know, we're 501c3. Our main emphasis is to renew the spirit of America um, and to get people to understand our founding first principles. And the way that I look at it is, is if you can understand that there's this thing called the rule of law and it's important, that there's this principle of equality and it's really important, that there's a principle of enumerated powers, uh, limited government, which means enumerated powers in federalism, um, that you can take that foundation and then apply it to current events. So uh, uh, um, if, for example, Congress passes a law, we're just gonna say, you know, the make everybody feel good law, okay? and 
you look at the constitution I mean, you know that there's a first principle, which is that there's a, the federal government supposed to be limited. And you look at the enumerated powers in the constitution, article one, section eight, and you look at all their powers and you say, Hmm, where is the power to make everybody feel good? You know, where, where is that power? Where, where's the general morality make everybody feel. And if you can understand that, then you can start making some serious changes in what, what our public policy is. Um, but if you don't understand that and you just kind of go along, well, the federal government can do anything it wants, then you're lost. You have no opportunity to challenge those kinds of uh, power grabs, so to speak. So I, th I think it's really um, important that people can get that foundation. And our public schools are not doing it today. Um, you know, the, there's studies upon studies that just reveal how abysmal um, our K through 12 students are doing, as well as uh, our general public. You know, less than half of the people can identify. There's three of us on the screen. Less than half of the people can identify the three branches of government. I, I, how hard is that, right? You got a legislative, executive, and a judicial branch. If you don't even know that, how can you possibly fight for enumerated powers, unalienable rights, and limited government, and all those kinds of things? So, um, there's also the there's also the problem of the administrative state, and mm -hmm. uh, my my, uh, my good friend Tim Sandifer uh, is fond of saying that Congress is really good at passing a law that says do good things yes and, and in order to do good things we will appoint an agency the bureau of good things that will uh, write rules and regulations it be basically uh, be a de facto legislator legislature with rules and regs to do good things and then be the judge and jury and uh, executor when it comes to people who uh, disobey the rules and regulations that it, that it is written is there any uh, hope to uh, repealing or, or reversing the the, uh, the the administrative state and, and the uh, the tentacles it has uh, uh, put into the economic system? Great question. So uh, if you go to patriotweek.org, one of the things you'll notice is that we, again, the three, the three branches of government, checks and balances, uh, enumerated powers, federalism, all those things. And if you, if you understand that, then um, there's a great question about how can the legislature delegate to an executive agency lawmaking authority. And um, for you know the US Supreme Court many years ago in the wake of the New Deal or during the New Deal rule, there used to be a doctrine called the non-delegation doctrine, which is that the, leg the Congress really can't give away its legislative authority because it violates article one, which says Congress shall you know, has the legislative power. But then they they said, yeah, that exists. But, uh, you know, all you have to do is kind of give them some goalpost for the legislative, for the administrative agency. I will say that um, uh, Neil Gorsuch, the, the Supreme Court justice who was recently appointed by Donald Trump and um, Justice Alito and some other justices have been raising some serious questions about um, administrative deferring to administrative agencies because not only do they see it's even worse than maybe what well, I don't know if it's worse but what they said what's going on right now is the Congress says we want you to do good things and then the administrative agency says here is this is what we mean by good things here's all these rules and if you don't follow the rules you're not doing good things and then someone gets some they someone gets uh you know, there's enforcement action against somebody and then they say oh um you're wrong, administrative agency, you're interpreting that your rule wrong. And then they get they go to the court and the court will say, well, we're going to defer to how the administrative agencies interprets the rule. OK, so that cuts against the Article three power of of the judiciary. Right. It's the the role and province of the judiciary to figure out what the law means. So not only is not only are they making the law, they're enforcing the law and then they're interpreting the law. So this is a serious question, question there. there. And, um, and um, my hope is that the Supreme Court with, with the newest justices are going to kind of unravel some of that. And I do think that there's some uh, uh, some constitutionally based uh, senators and, and people in the House that are very concerned about this. Um, and hopefully it doesn't get wrapped up in partisan politics, although it often does. But I do. The question was, is there hope? Yes, there's hope. Um, we can always hope. We'll see what happens.
Yeah, we talk about the rule of law and, and the difference between the United States and previous countries with the, that the rule of law was supposed to apply to the government and the agents of the government as equally as to the citizens, right? That was the difference. Citizens have always had to uh, live by the rule of law, right? It was the agents of the government that didn't. And the United States was supposed to be different. And we've gotten that mindset has gotten completely far away. How do we as average citizens get our that mindset back to us? Well, that's that's a great question. I, I just want to I'm going to pull out my book called America's Survival Guide: How to Stop America How to Stop America's Impending Suicide by Reclaiming Our Founding First Principles in History. Just put American Survival Guide in. You can get it on my website or um, Amazon and all that stuff. And I, it's just a suggestion. I'm just being informative. Uh, but the I wanted to read John Adams, who said that in the earliest ages of the world. Absolute monarchy seems to have been the universal form of government. Kings and a few of their great counselors, captains, exercised a cruel tyranny over the people. But then he later said that the definition of a free republic is an empire of the laws. So you're not doing what the king wants. You're not doing what the duke wants. You're doing what the law says. And then to your point about it applying to everybody, Sam Adams, who we know because of his great beer, uh, and also the second... Um, cousin of John wrote that the first principles of natural law and justice uh, provide that government has no right to absolute power over the lives and fortunes of the people, but it is bound to see that justice is dispensed and that the rights of the subjects be decided by promulgated standing and known laws. And he also said it should apply to the plowman in the field as well as to the king. Um, so in our words, the janitor to the president, uh, the prisoner to the Supreme Court, everybody should follow the same law. And I, I, I do think that we've we've lost some of that. I mean, you can just see how um, there's a sense of entitlement, the sense that you can do whatever you want, not get caught, get favoritism. Um, in connection with the application of the law, it's a serious, serious problem that undermines the confidence of our of our free republic. There was a time when, when uh, juries could determine the law as well as uh, the facts. Yeah. And you know it's, it's uh, called jury nullification. Where is that going? Is that is that uh, is it going to uh, be used to get rid of some of these bad laws at some point? You know, it's a great question, um, and and there's a real tension because the rule of law says everybody's supposed to follow law, right? So then juries should follow the law. But there's no question that there has been a long-standing American tradition of juries acquitting people when they feel the law is unjust. On the contrary, you know, the opposite of that, there's also been jury nullification where jurors um, would acquit, I, I'm gonna go talk back to the South again, where there was ample evidence that some KKK member had lynched someone. They were prosecuted and the jury, the all white man jury said, nope, we're not gonna prosecute, you know, we're not gonna convict. So that's a two edged sword. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's at its finest when there is an unjust law in the truly unjust and in light of our founding first principles and says, we're not going to go along with this. We're not going to support a tyrannical regime. And it's at its worst when it's not allowing justice when it should be done. Um, in Michigan, at least, we have a, a jury instruction where we say you, the jury is supposed to follow the law. But we know that at times juries ignore that instruction and they they it's usually in a criminal case and they acquit a defendant where you're like hmm i'm not so sure about that but you know they found that the application of the law to a particular defendant was uh un, unjust and unfair um and so that's that is it's kind of a silent prerogative of the jury it's not something that's advertised in jury instructions but but they're smart. It still, it still exists in, in, yeah. in de facto. Then you put you put twelve people in the room, and they're gonna if they they think it's a dumb prosecution, they're gonna toss it out. I mean, that's that's just the practical reality. Well, I, that's kind of we hope that's why you should probably do jury duty, right? I know we all kind of avoid jury duty like the plague, even though I went for mine the last time they called. I did actually eventually did mine, but <laughs> but we should actually all do jury duty because there is a chance that you might actually impact something one way or the other that might have gone, you know, an honorable person in a jury room can do a lot of good, right? Absolutely. And in fact, I have a really long jury speech, which I'm not going to bore your folks. <laughs> I know how much time we got. We don't have time for it. But it really, the right to the jury is a hedge against tyranny. It is, um, that's why we have juries. 
And um, if you believe in liberty and freedom, then you should be you should be pleased to serve on a jury so that you can do your your part in ensuring that the government is uh, not uh, crushing your freedoms and that, um, uh, you know, and fulfill your civic duty in that way. And if you believe in contracts, for example, you want to you want to help enforce a contract. You know, it, I don't think it. Um, uh, if, if you're a libertarian, I know that some people say, well, you shouldn't coerce me into going. But in the broader global sense, I think it, it, it really um, enforces all the things that um, that libertarians believe in. Well, while we got you here, the, what's the kind of the average jury case? Just while we only got like two minutes. So what, what's kind of the average? So if someone just first time going through jury duty, how long was the average case take? You know, a couple uh, of days? There, there's no such thing as an average, but they tend to range from uh, very short cases can go a day. Usually they're two or three. I've had some that have gone a couple months, but they're typically a two day experience. You know, so the chances of you getting stuck on a jury that's going to go three or four or more days is at least in Michigan, in my experience, um, you know, maybe a 20%. So by 80% of the time, you're getting out of there in a couple of days. Yeah, well, I know I sat in a way, I sat in a waiting room doing puzzles like for eight hours a day. I would have rather been on a jury, you know, at least it would have been interesting right. <laughs> rather than just sitting there playing with a puzzle all day. And yeah. you get there and you go, oh man, there's like six pieces missing. <laughs> But I guess I've, I've been I've been kicked off every jury I've ever been called for. So that's fine. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. I really. think I'd make sure you serve. All right, so we've got one minute left. If we can give you a, a breakdown of your your podcast again and tell us where breakdown, you yeah, yeah, and, and your book and and uh, right. so uh, again, your, book is about America's survival guide: how to stop America's impending suicide by reclaiming our founding first principles and history. Um, PatriotWeek.org is the organization my daughter and I started to help renew the spirit of America based on our founding first principles. And the podcast is, uh, and you like this last episode, it's about limited government. Um, and uh, I, we talk about Star Wars, the Lord of the Rings, um, and uh, the French Revolution. It, it's, it's, it's really cool. Cool. Well, I'm going to have to check you out because I yeah. like history and, and society and all that seems kind of interesting to me. Yeah. So I'm going to have to spend some time taking yeah. it out. We thank you for coming on. Richard, you got anything left to close out? Anything? Any how, how old is your daughter when she started doing all this? She started, she was 10 when she pounded out. Congratulations to your daughter. Yeah. Was she the guiding force or were you? Uh, it was a collaborative effort. She sparked it. Good. Uh, I was complaining. She got mad. Said we're gonna, we need to do something. And at that point, I was like, okay. So that's how Patriot right. Week got started. Yeah. All right. All right. And that's all the time we have. Thank you for coming, uh, Richard. Thank you for being here, everybody. Thank you for watching. You can catch us on Libertarian Counterpoint and search for us on Facebook and all the various social media outlets. And thank you, everybody. And have a good day. And please remember, from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan. Thank you for watching. Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.